this has got to work first. Give me a, put me on the screen for just a little bit. No, not me, but there you go. So we're there, right? Leave it there. We're good. Okay. I have, I am amazed that I'm here. Uh, in many ways that I'm alive uh, through the years, but just that I'm here and it's all because of some sojourners 35 years ago that uh, planted the seed and the idea uh, into our hearts. This is our first workshop. We're very, very excited about that. That's uh, just a tremendous thing. But then I get to speak um, and I appreciate my brother Larry and my other brother Larry <laughs> and tomorrow my brother Larry uh, uh, for their for their lessons, uh, I feel like I'm on a, a flip side of the Bob Newhart show. Uh, hi, my name's Daryl. This is my brother. Or what was it? He's Larry and his brother Daryl and his other brother Daryl. And here I am up here. But just the fact that I get to do this is amazing. This is this has got to be one of the highlights of my ministry. Uh, in in so many ways. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to take a picture. Uh, now Don is the photographer, and uh, and so. We're going to do the best that we can, get as many as you can in here. Let me get rid of the microphone. Uh, I've got rid of some of you. That helps. Okay, now let's try this and do a little technology here. Uh, go ahead and click that, see how it worked. Put the screen up there, Ronnie. Go back. You know, I think you went backwards. One more. Try one more. You're going back. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, okay, we'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, I do appreciate uh, all your prayers for Donna. She's doing super, and everything is going great, and she's working real hard. Don't do that again. Um, <clears throat> and just go, go forward so we don't have to go backwards. Um, I, I, uh, I really can't tell you what, uh, how much I appreciate the prayers and, and how well God has answered uh, answered those prayers. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And when Mike called and said, hey, would you like to speak? And I said, what are the different topics? And he said, well, I've got this one on hope. I said, I'll take it. I, I just love talking about hope. I love Dave's book. I've started to read it. Uh, the song we sing, words of life, words of hope, give us strength and help us cope. Uh, I see this too much in uh, my family, in, my, in the world we live in, that in this world people are losing hope. And I'm not just talking about spiritual hope, I'm talking about all kinds of hope. Uh, I, I don't listen to the news anymore. I, re I, I, I would like for all of you to like me on Facebook or be a friend on Facebook. I will accept uh, your, your friendship, and, and if you send anything political, I won't read it. I've got this great eye for scanning and just going past all that. You send me a joke, I'll send you a better one. Um, you send me something encouraging, I'll like it or love it. Or if you send me a prayer request, I'll pray. But people are hurting and they're lost. And it isn't just because of, of not accepting the gospel. It's because they don't see hope. They don't even know where to look for it. Because there's no evidence of others trying to show hope to the world. And they have millions of dollars. And some of them live on food stamps. They live in large homes. They live in RVs. They live in cardboard boxes. Uh, we see it a lot when we are in Central America or when we're cleaning up after a disaster. And they're filled with pain. And at the same time, they have empty hearts. And it's all because they don't have hope. And maybe they did at one time. Maybe they lost it. Maybe they misplaced it. Maybe it's you. Uh, sometimes it could be me. But maybe they never even had it. And maybe you can relate to that. But Paul teaches us, and, and this is just a phenomenal passage out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. I was sharing with this with someone uh, just yesterday about being at a, preaching a funeral. Uh, the funeral director calls and asks, us, asks me if I could do this graveside funeral. 
And it was the coldest funeral I'd ever been a part of. And the weather wasn't cold. There was no hope in their eyes. There was no hope for the person, but there was no hope for them for tomorrow in, in their minds and in their hearts. But God's word is very determined that he wants all men to be filled with hope. But he also wants all Christians especially to realize that the hope that they have. And hope is not a wish. Like I hope I get a pony. Uh, and I don't by the way. Uh, I hope I get a pony for Christmas. It's, it's, uh, it's what I call a spiritual tangible. It's, it's something that you can hold on to. It's spiritual that you can't see. But you've got it. And God gives it to you. And God says, I want you to hold on to this. And I don't want you to ever let it go. And I want you to know this more than anything else. No one can take away your hope. No one. It's in Jesus Christ. It's eternal. And I may repeat these things as we go through all this. But no one could take that away. But we have hope. But those outside of Christ don't have hope. And that's part of our mission. That's part of the reason we go where we go. And that's why we're, we're kind to the waitress or the waiter at the restaurant. That's why we're kind to people and show them hope through our eyes because we want them to know that they have value, that they're special, not just in our eyes, but in the eyes of God. And hopefully they'll want to know more about our message. But whenever we look into the ministry of Jesus, we see people. And and God wants us to see those people. We see all kinds of people. And and some are rich and some are poor. Some are lined up uh, along the side of the road. Or some of them are up in a tree. And some are sitting in synagogues. And and some have just lost loved ones that are special to them. And and some of them um, might be in a fishing boat or hanging beside him on a cross. And some have just lost those loved ones or they've lost their sight or they've lost their sanity. And no one knows why, but they're searching. And they may not even know what they're searching for, but they're searching for some kind of hope. The Jews were looking for it from God. They were awaiting someone to come who was a savior, a messiah, a conqueror, the Christ, a deliverer. And even though they didn't understand this, they didn't understand who this was or what he could do, when they saw Jesus, they saw hope. And they couldn't explain it. And and they're looking for him. And they're looking for someone. And here he is. And so they followed Jesus because he was the one who gave them hope. And the people we interact with in life every day are no different than this. They're searching for hope and they're trying to find it in a lottery ticket or an immoral relationship. I gotta, I've got to say, I'm going to say something. I hope I don't run out of time because my wife just went back there and she's the timekeeper. Um, but but uh, one of the things about, I, I, I went to a casino one time for a concert uh, and that was the reason. And my sister one time went to a casino and she said she bid uh, a dollar. And she was going to lose the dollar in pennies, 100 pennies. And so I was in a casino and I asked somebody to explain, you know, how all this works. And they said that. And I had a dollar. And I realized that God had given me that dollar. And if I gambled it, I'd be telling him it wasn't good enough. It was just one dollar, right? It was just entertainment or whatever. But I also want you to think about this. Someone has given this mission graciously enough money for you to travel someplace that you may not be able to afford to travel. And if you don't take the money from God, you're missing out on giving somebody else a blessing from God. Amen. So use the funds because the money, you know, I, I know without a doubt what, what Charles was saying is the money is not supposed to be sitting in the bank. And, and we'll get more money because God will give us more money. That's not a problem. But use that. Find a way to realize the blessings that we have that we can give to God. Now I've got to figure out where I was in the notes. Um, but they're looking for it. People are looking for it in drugs. They're looking for it in alcohol. They're searching uh, for it in every way. And sometimes they're escaping from an attempt to even find it because they don't want the truth. That's the bottom line. 
They don't want what we have because it requires sacrifice, it requires a change of life, and yet they're miserable and they're hopeless through all of this. And, and they're giving their lives to their job or they're doing nothing because they believe there are nothing. And even some of you are searching for it right now, even in this room. Isn't that amazing? But, but it's not a, a, a curse against you or it's not a slander against you. It's just a fact that you're struggling to find hope even in your life as a Christian. And we'll see that in people. And here we are, sitting with the greatest message of hope that the world has ever had and, and the only message they ever will have. And sometimes, truthfully, our silence is deafening. And I'm really, I really hate saying that in here because, uh, uh, man, I tell you, sojourners, the servant heart is what I've seen more. I saw it 35 years ago, and I've experienced it on these sojourns, and I've never witnessed anything like it in my life. It is just a, a remarkable experience to be working side by side with you guys. But in referring to this lack of hope, one of my heroes, uh, Jim McGuigan, uh, writes, Haven't we seen this, you and I, again and again? People who live alone in the twilight, crippled by criticism, crushed by injustice, timid and afraid, always fretting, and instinctively covering their heads and their hearts against expected blows. Then to their astonishment, they come across someone, someone who loves them, who really does love them, and heaps on them judicious praise and calls them to richer living. Something like a miracle happens. They begin to unfold like a flower in the sun and change into the most amazing and glorious people. The message for us is that it's okay to hope again. The ancient word of God declares to everyone there is hope. There is spiritual hope for every single person in this nation, in our world, no matter who they are and no matter what they have done. One of my favorite passages is out of, of, of Romans chapter 4, verse 25, which, it, which says that, that Jesus was raised to life because of our justification. In other words, if Jesus' sacrifice wasn't good enough for you or for me or for anyone else in this world, God wouldn't have raised him. But God has raised him from the dead and everyone can be saved. Everyone can be, I prefer to say, everyone can be rescued. And we need to find those people that are struggling and, and, and feel like they're without hope and say, I've got something for you and, and show it to them through the way that we live. But people followed Jesus until following Jesus led to a cross. And here's the amazing thing that we sometimes criticize the people or whatever. They couldn't follow Jesus to the cross. Jesus didn't want them to follow him to the cross. God didn't want them to follow him to the cross. Jesus needed to be up on that cross alone to die for you and me. And they needed to be here so that they could spread the message of hope into the world. But then he died on that cross, and when he died, everything that he had ever taught, all the hope that they had in him, it died as well. Three days later, he's raised from the dead, but still, believe it or not, hope is dead. Hope is dead for the disciples. In Luke 24, two of them are walking along the road, and they're talking to each other about everything that happened, including an empty tomb, of all things. And Jesus joins them. Isn't that cool? Just kind of walking along and joins them in the conversation. And starting in verse 17, what's this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man... Hear this word. A man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And, 
and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Now here's the key of the passage. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hope. You know how they felt? I mean, you've probably experienced that at some time or another. You've gone through something in life that you had hoped would be the answer to your dreams, and yet it wasn't. And then you may have been, or maybe you are, totally without hope, totally hopeless, and nobody even knows it. But Jesus tells them, starting in verse 25, Oh, foolish ones. I'm not calling you foolish, by the way. Um, Jesus is. Um, oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe all that these words that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, beginning with the ancient word of God, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He tells them the whole story, his story, the whole story of Jesus. The story of Jesus begins in Genesis and it goes all the way through in your Bible to maps. Just look at that index that we were talking about yesterday for Larry was talking about. Genesis to maps, it's about Jesus, the whole thing. And Jesus starts telling them everything, everything about those ancient words. So in verse 28, so they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's towards evening, and the end of the day, now, or the end of the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, I kind of like that statement, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And their eyes were open. And they recognized him. They recognized hope is what they recognized, by the way. And he vanished from their sight. And then they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour, returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were gathered together, and saying, the Lord has risen indeed. And he has appeared to Simon. And when they told him what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And as they were talking about this, as they were talking about this, Jesus stood among them and said, peace. Isn't that a great word? (laughs) Peace. That's another spiritual tangible, by the way. Something we have that we can hold on to. Peace to you. Here's the, the one that they're talking about being crucified. The one that had, they, they put all their hope in who had died. And now he appears and the first thing he says to them is peace. You have peace when you have hope. But their message, the hope came alive when Jesus was sharing with them the fulfillment of the scriptures. When he was telling them the word of God. When he's standing before them as the word of God. I know we're not Jesus, but we can do that. We can be the word of God to people. And Jesus wants us to have hope, to continue to hope, no matter what. He wants us to live again and and to share, to teach the world about hope so that people can live again. Can you see the difference of having hope and not having hope? Having Jesus and not having Jesus. But if Jesus didn't die, no one would have hope. Of all the people who experienced this, my favorite's Peter. I, I love Peter. I, I, if I had time enough to do another sermon, I'd give you another sermon on Peter that I really love to preach. But Peter stands out, strikes the servant or, uh, of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Okay, that's another thing. Okay, can you imagine this guy standing there in the dark? Peter comes along, slices off his ear. Jesus picks up the ear and sticks it back on. Okay? This guy knows his ear got hit, knocked off, right? And he's standing there with blood on his uniform. Now he's got to go home and explain to his wife why he's got blood on his uniform. Okay? And here's this guy standing there with his ear, and, and everybody flees, right? And they take Jesus off, and I, I've got this vision. He's standing in the courtyard going, he cut off my ear, it fell to the ground, this guy picked it up, put it back on, nobody's going to believe this, Right? 
But Peter's the one who did that. He's the one who follows Jesus. He stands in the courtyard. He's the one who denies Jesus and looks straight into the eyes of Jesus. He's the one who stood at a distance and watched Jesus die. He's one of the ones who went to the empty tomb. And he's the one that Jesus says, feed my sheep. And after watching Jesus ascend to heaven and being filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter is the one who stands before Israel and proclaims for the very first time the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means for our salvation, what it means for our hope. And he's the one who stands before the Sanhedrin with John in Acts chapter 4 verse 19, after fleeing, after denying, after doing all the things that he shouldn't do, he stands before the Sanhedrin and he says, hey, judge for yourself whether it's right in God's sight to obey you, you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We've got to get our hope to that point. We can't help it. We've got to speak about what we've seen and heard because people are hopeless and there's only one message and we got it and they need it. And this is one of my favorite parts that Peter writes. As much as 30 years later, that hope that Peter has, it's still right there. It's still fresh in his heart. And he writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, don't miss this. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope. Amen. It's still alive. It'll never die. A living hope. It came, he says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, you who by God's power are being guarded through your faith for a salvation ready to, be in the real, ready to be revealed in the last time. See, hope had died when Jesus died, but because of God's mercy, we have a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection, and that's the message we proclaim to everyone. The question is, do we have that hope? Do we realize we have that hope? Do we realize how precious that hope is? Romans 5, verse 1 through 5, since, therefore, since, that word therefore is you've got to find out why it was therefore. Go back to chapter 4, verse 25, the resurrection, the, the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, the rescue that we have through him. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God, our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, we rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character, hope. And hope, Paul says, does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. We are justified through faith. We have peace through God, through Jesus Christ. We have gained access by faith into this grace. We rejoice in the glory of God. We can rejoice because, and we rejoice because, no matter what. Why? Because hope doesn't disappoint us. How do we know? We know because God has poured out his love in our hearts, the Holy Spirit through his given us, and the Holy Spirit keeps on telling us, you know, God's on the throne, Jesus is at right hand, the Holy Spirit came to the earth, he hadn't left. He's pouring out his love into us. He, he's telling us constantly, I'm right here for you. Uh, and God's right here for you. And, and he's protecting us and, and blessing us and giving us everything that we need because in Jesus Christ we have hope. I don't know why, but, and, and I'm among you, that sometimes we have a difficulty teaching people the gospel. Sometimes we have a hard time inviting people, even people we love, to be with us for worship. And I think it's because we really don't grasp this. We really don't understand the way that we need to. We don't understand the blessing, that hope that we already have. We, we, we don't have the faith that we need to have. Because Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 tells us faith is being sure 
of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. There are so many ancient words in the scripture where God gives us the assurance of our hope in Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. And it's because God wants us to know that no matter what life brings, we have a living hope that will never perish, spoil, or fade because our hope is not on this earth. Our hope is kept in heaven. And, and, it, and, and the earth can't, Satan can't touch us. You realize that? The only way Satan can touch you is if you let him. Satan has no control over you whatsoever except the control you give him. And, and our hope is in heaven. The passage that we've used in, in Romans chapter 5 verse 4 that this is um, based on carries the words of blessing starting in verse 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Jesus Christ had. So that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Now to him, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the one and only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. If you're subject to the invitation... No. <laughs>